Good morning as we come together for our third Sunday in Advent, December 13th. I am so glad that you have decided to join me on our virtual worship service as we come together for this time of preparation and excitement and anticipation that Jesus Christ is coming into the world, and we've only got a couple of weeks left. I know, it's hard to imagine. In fact, I think we might be less than a couple of weeks left until at this point. So that is an amazing uh, reality that we are living, uh, that in a world even as weird and strange as 2020, uh, the reality is we still have the hope of Jesus coming into the world. I hope that uh, you'll be involved in the ways that we can. Uh, we have lots of different things coming down the pike. Uh, not only are we meeting in person every week, and I hope that you can still uh, sign up and be a part of our weekly Advent services at 3.30 in the evening, but on Easter or Christmas week, um, we will be also having a blue Christmas service when we remember that Christmas isn't always a happy time, and especially in 2020, perhaps uh, we are grieving uh, for all sorts of different reasons, and our Blue Christmas drive-in service will be at 3.30 on uh, blue on the 21st of December, and then we will also be having two in-person drive-in uh, Christmas Eve services as well as a virtual service on Christmas Eve that will go up. And we hope that you can be a part of those, one at 3.30, one at 5.30. Lots of amazing things. But um, most pressing today is that right after the service is over, if you are watching this live at 10 a.m., we are going to be having the Bethlehem Market on Zoom. Um, if you have not gotten that link, I think I'll probably put it in the, uh, the somehow find a way to make sure that you get the link so that we can all be a part of uh, Bethlehem Market, which is a way to get together and help support ministries and hear from uh, representatives of ministries all over the world to hear what they've been doing, especially in 2020, to do their uh, so important work and find ways that we might purchase from them and support them. Uh, so I hope that you'll be a part of that, but that also means we will not be having coffee chat today since it would be at the same time, and I'd rather everybody that would take part in coffee chat take part in Bethlehem Market. Um, but I hope that you'll be a part of that with me. I hope that you'll join me as we uh, get excited about Advent, and let us now begin our worship today with a prayer. Please join me in our call to worship. We gather today on this third week of Advent. In this difficult time, we join together and worship with joy in our hearts. We wait, we prepare, and we worship together today with joy. Amen. The King of Glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before Him, lift up your voices. Who is the King of Glory? How shall we call Him? He is Emmanuel, the promised of ages. The King of Glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before Him, lift up your voices. In all of Galilee and city or village, He goes among His people during their illness. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gate before Him, lift up your voices. Sing then of David, so little Savior and brother. In all of Galilee was never another. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the Good morning, Santa United Methodist Church. We want everything to look nice, the decorations of the season, our homes with their lights, and tinsel wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it's tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give you a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, 
The mantle of praise is set up of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season. Not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Good morning. Welcome to Children's Moment at Santee UMC. My name is Miss Jen, and I'm so very happy that you could join us today on this third Sunday in Advent. Today we light our third candle, and it's a special one. It's the pink one, and it represents joy. Some people get joy and happiness confused. Do you know the difference? Happiness is a reaction to something around us. The smell of freshly baked cookies might make you happy. Getting a gift that you've wanted for a really long time might make you happy. But once those brief moments come and go, like maybe after you've eaten all the cookies up, or the toy that you got gets kind of boring or, or even breaks, your happiness, it might fade away. Joy, on the other hand, goes much deeper than that. It's something deep inside of us that's created by knowing that God has a powerful, unconditional love for us. A love so powerful that God came to us in human form as Jesus. Another name that we know Jesus by is Emmanuel. And that means God with us. Isn't that beautiful? It brings me so much joy knowing that God's love for me and for you is so great. He came to us as Jesus. And the best part, we can still see God around us today. We see God in the faces of our neighbors. We see God when people share their joy through selfless and compassionate acts. I see God at work when the volunteers serve others in Naomi's closet. I see God at work when the pancake breakfast team feeds our hungry neighbors. I see God at work in you every time you share that joy that you have deep inside with someone else. It brings me so much comfort and joy to know that God is still with us. Emmanuel. Are you ready to see the next few pieces in our nativity? 
So the first week we put Mary and Joseph in there. And last week we put the shepherd and the angel in. This week, what do you think we have? Now these figures are my favorite favorites and one in particular. So when the kids were little and we created this nativity, they were trying to decide what pieces needed to go into it. And they said we needed, um, let's see, we needed a cow. Okay. See our little cow. So we'll put the cow right here and a lamb, of course, for the shepherd, right? And um, they said we needed a bird. Um, well, certain birds do make us think of the Holy Spirit. So we'll put him right here by the fancy little tree we have. But my favorite are you ready for these? I present to you the nativity pugs. So we actually have two pugs right here. I think this one is one that Mr. Jared or I made. Can you see that? And here is the beautiful little one that Dakota made. And he has since lost uh, part of his eyeball, but he has all of his pudgy little feet and his curly tail. And I just think that he's adorable, our nativity pug. Have you ever seen a nativity pug before? Do you think there were pugs in the manger when Jesus was born? When my kids were small, we rescued a pug, and I named her Wicket because her little smooshed-up face reminded me of the Ewoks in Return of the Jedi. Wicket loved our children. Her love for them was unconditional. She watched over them and played with them. They couldn't do anything to our sweet little Wicket that would make her stop loving them. Imagine that love, so pure and unconditional, and then multiply it times infinity, and that's God's love for us. Dakota especially became very attached to Wicket the Pug. So when we were talking about who needed to go into the nativity and why, Dakota decided our baby Jesus had to have a pug to watch over him and love him. And every time I see our nativity pug, I feel so joyful because I'm reminded of God's powerful and unconditional love for us. I'm reminded that God is still with us, working through us, and that we're called to share our joy with those around us. Please pray with me. Lord God, we are so grateful for the deep joy that comes from knowing you love us. As we go about our week, God, help us to watch for the many ways you're working through us and those around us, reminding us that you will always, always be with us. Help us to remember to share your love and our joy with everyone we come across. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. I can't wait to see you again soon. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and I love you. Bye. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is a reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this word.
So at this point, we are more than halfway through the Advent season as we come together for this third week in Advent, which means we're also three weeks into our discussion of the names and titles of Jesus Christ, uh, which also connects with the study that we've been doing on Monday and Wednesdays um, that has to do with the, the book by Adam Hamilton called Incarnation. But as we go through this Advent season, remembering that it is also it is a season of preparation for anticipation and preparation for Christmas. Not just Christmas's past, but Christmas's present and Christmas's future. Uh, I've said before that this is a wonderful reminder that we as Christians believe time is not linear, it is cyclical. That things happen and they happen and they happen again. And so when we anticipate Christmas, we are anticipating the Christmas past as we remember how God first came into the world in a little town called Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. We are remembering Christmas's present, that God is breaking into our world each and every day, and that is a hope that the world needs so much of, especially in 2020. Because for people all over the world, it is wonderful to know that you might come to know and experience God's love for the first time today, tomorrow. And if that's the case, then in that way, you have experienced Christmas for the first time. And then we also are remembering and anticipating Christmas future. The concept that while it is continuing to happen in individuals, it will happen on a global scale eventually. That God is going to break into our world. A kingdom of heaven is going to come to the earth. No matter what craziness we might face from pandemics and quarantines to uncertainties in health and relationship struggles or uh, all these different issues that you face on your own, we face collectively, we have a hope as Christians. God is working to make everything new. And it isn't a question of if, it's a question of when it's going to happen. That's the season we're in. That is Advent. That is what we are anticipating. But Advent is also a time of preparation. Because if we are expecting God to enter into our world, be it in the present or in the future, then much like when we expect company for Christmas, and maybe we are this year, maybe we're having to do things a lot different uh, if we remember what it's like to expect company, you know we have to prepare. We have to prepare ourselves. We have to prepare uh, a place. We have to prepare all of the things for that company to arrive. And in the case of Advent, we have to prepare for God to enter the world. That's what we've been talking about in this sermon series, really. In discussing the names and titles of Christ, we are really looking at what it was that God promised Jesus was going to be, how Jesus delivered on those promises, and then maybe how we were wrong in what we expected from those promises. By figuring out if our expectations look different than what God's reality came out to be uh, the first time, we might work out how we should look out for Jesus as he arrives today. With that in mind, we started this series two weeks ago talking about Jesus as a king, an anointed one. Uh, in Greek, that word is Christ. In Hebrew, that word is Messiah. Uh, but he was the one who would fulfill prophecy. And we talked about how the Israelites had certain expectations of what a king was. And Jesus barely fulfilled any of those. Perhaps we also have expectations of how a ruler should and will act and what Jesus should and will do when he comes back. And I promise you, Jesus won't do those things the way we want. Jesus was a different kind of king. Really an ideal anointed one who came to teach us how to live. Teach us through an example that we are, even the rulers of the world, should be serving everyone rather than being served. And teaching us in the process, we've been wrong about what a good ruler looks like all along. We still are in 2020. 
Then last week we moved on to Jesus as a Savior. Perhaps the best known title of Jesus' life, at least in Christian circles, and how Jesus saves us from ourselves and from a world that tries to fit us into a mold. We discussed the idea that we say in our communion liturgy every month, that Jesus saves us from sin and death, and how sin is really our selfishness that keeps us from loving our neighbor, and then as a result, by extension, since we don't love our neighbors, we can't love God. And in freeing us from that selfishness or from the, the, the doom of having to be selfish, showing us that God's love for us, no matter what we've done, will free us from that or, or what we've left undone and that we can be better, we can work towards doing things differently. It also frees us from the boxes the world tries to put us in. The things we ought to be, the things we ought to do, the things we ought to like or dislike, it frees us from the feeling that when we don't live up to those expectations, when the world says, well, what we really want is somebody who is essential, who does the things that we want and value, and we don't want the person who does the things we don't think are important. And when you don't do those things well... You skip to feeling like, well, I don't have worth for society. I don't have worth. I'm, I'm not a, a perfect cog in the machine, so to speak. And Jesus came along to save us from the idea that that is our purpose, is to be a cog in a machine. And instead, to realize that you are loved. I am loved. We are beloved by God. Not because of what we do, but because of who we are. And that realization is akin to finding new life itself. It's also a reminder that the systems that try to uh, tell us we are good or bad are not uh, God. And now we turn to week three. And now we are discussing a word called Emmanuel. And if you haven't been involved in the church, um, or if you have been involved in the church in the past, you've probably heard this word from time to time. You might even know what it means. And if you've heard any type of music involved in hymns of the Christmas nature, you've probably heard this word before. And honestly, if you haven't been involved in church at all, you might have, because there's so much Christmas music going around all of the time this year. I think 96.5 uh, started right after Halloween, and that at least is in one way in which uh, Alabama and California aren't that different. There's at least one radio station playing Christmas music for months leading up to Christmas. And if you listen long enough, well, first you're probably going to get tired of hearing Mariah Carey's um, last, uh, All I Want for Christmas is You. But the second thing is eventually you'll probably hear a song that says the word Emmanuel which literally means God is with us. And it's a name that is given to Jesus in the scriptures by an angel who comes to Joseph to tell him about what's going on. But the name wasn't originally meant for Jesus. Indeed, it originally came from a prophecy in the book of Isaiah in which the prophet said, and the angel quotes in Matthew, look or behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, originally, this prophecy had to do with the kingdom of Judah, which existed 700 years before Jesus came along, which is hard to wrap your head around sometimes, that the amount of years that go on in the Bible, because if you think about that, if it were the, an equivalent, that would be the 1300s. Um, back before uh, the United States was even a, a thought, uh, before there were such things as all sorts of craziness, was different. Um, but in the point is that in the kingdom of Judah, um, which was a kingdom loyal to God, it was facing significant threats from it, of violence and war from its neighbors. They were terrified that if they didn't bend to unreasonable demands, that they were going to be destroyed. And God sent this prophet named Isaiah and told the people, God is going to be with you. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. Hold fast. Make the right decision. Do not give in to these unreasonable demands. 
even if you think that's going to lead to your destruction at the hands of these neighbors. And in the end, that prophecy ended up being right. In the end, two nations arrayed against Judah ended up being destroyed themselves before they could inflict the damage that they said they were going to on the kingdom of Judah. But the prophecy didn't end or it didn't become obsolete then. If you've ever heard me talk about prophecy, and you will, it's one of my favorite topics, you'll know that I always say prophecy is not a weather prediction. It's not a single-use thing that was done after the prophecy is fulfilled because prophecy holds truths that are timeless. And in this case, Matthew, the gospel writer, recognized the parallels between Isaiah's prophecy and Jesus' birth and realize that those parallels were intentional. And so he reclaims the name Emmanuel for Jesus Christ. And through it, he reminds us that through Jesus Christ, God had well and truly come to be with us. Indeed, through Christ and Matthew, uh, Matthew and we Christians believe that it fulfilled the prophecy in ways that are more complete but this is where we get into the weeds. Because when we say Emmanuel, when we explain that God is with us and that's what it means, then, you know, there's a pretty straightforward concept. Oh, yeah, God is always with us. That's a commonly understood idea. Uh, you can take it, you can leave it, you can believe in it, you cannot believe in it. But the idea is, well, God is always around. God is with us. Arguably, that's the concept I think Isaiah meant to convey to the people of Judah in the 700s BC, that no matter what you face, God is going to be with you. And as it says there and elsewhere in the Bible, that means we don't have to be afraid of what might happen because we're not going to be alone. I've said as much in plenty of sermons before. But when we apply the term Emmanuel as a title to Jesus specifically, it opens us up to new possibilities, new wonders. It changes the meaning itself and makes it miraculous. Now, there are perhaps countless ways. We could talk about this for years. But today I want to focus on two specific ways that using the word Emmanuel for Jesus changes the meaning from what it originally meant I would uh, make the case. The first way is that it changes uh, things in... It changes the, the way that we Christians believe about what it means. And, and about and it talks about what God, we believe as Christians about Jesus' identity. That was complicated. Um, basically, if Jesus is quite literally, as the title suggests, God with us, then the reality is that in that first Christmas, God took on a human form and came to be with us. Now, this is a very complicated theological concept, and it's really hard to grasp when you really start getting deeper into it. Because what that's saying, to me at least, is this is the God of creation we're talking about. The God that made the universe, the God that, as some theologians would say, are the very ground of all being, which means that without God, nothing could exist, that existence itself has to be centered on God. And for the fact that God would somehow come into is almost paradoxical. It doesn't make sense. But I like the example that Adam Hamilton used to discuss this complex topic, topic in the book by discussing a solar eclipse. If you've ever had a chance to see a solar eclipse, it's a wonderful experience. If you haven't, when you get a chance, do it. But you have to know you have to wear a spe special kind of glasses because you can't look up and stare directly at the sun, even if it's mainly obscured by the moon, because it will destroy your eyes. And that is just one star in a universe that is made up of billions, millions of billions of stars, and some of them are larger than our sun. Most of them, maybe, I don't know. But God created them all. God created all of that stuff, and yet... And, and so if God created them all, 
uh, and we can't even look at a single one of those stars without destroying our eyes. How do we expect that we would understand the God of creation? <laughs> and yet when we say the word Emmanuel, is that God taking on human form? That God that should be aloof and detached, a clockmaker who makes beautiful and intricate machinery in the universe and then says, okay, I've got other things to do. And yet, somehow, some reason cared enough about us to enter into that creation. Not just take on human form, but become human in order to understand what we know. Which really means something profound. It means God has experienced what we experience, lived what we live, felt what we felt, feel, struggled with what we struggle with, was tempted by what we are tempted by. You see, in Jesus, God not only wanted us to know that despite being a creator, God cares for us, but that God wanted to experience life as we do. You are not only loved, you are understood by the God of creation. The passage we've read today puts it this way. For we do not have a high priest. The high priest refers to the Son of God or Jesus Christ, who is, not, is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are. See, that for me is both amazing and comforting because it means that when we say God is with us, Emmanuel, it means in a very real way that God has come alongside us in our loneliness, in our uh, celebrations, in our pains, in our um, joys, in our fears, in our loves, in our health crises and financial insecurities. Uh, when we grieve the loss of a loved one, God, in our good days and bad, God knows those emotions. God has experienced those things as Jesus Christ, being fully human. Which means that God, when God is with us, sympathizes with us, connects with us, comforts us. That's a revolutionary idea. One that, at least in my understanding, is perhaps unique in every religion in the world. Because, yeah, there are plenty of pantheistic religions where gods spend a lot of time on earth, but there is no other concept of a god of creation. The unknowable being that is outside of time and space, stepping into that creation and experiencing it as one of us with the goal of loving us. So that's the first amazing change. The second amazing change is in how we expect God to be with us. Because if Jesus, this carpenter from Nazareth, is God as a human, then it also means that God is with us in our humanity, which also means God is still with us in each other. Here's what I mean by that. There's a video you can find on the internet, and I recommend looking it up, even if I'm going to be telling you the whole video. It's, it's worth checking out. It's called, and you can find it on YouTube because I looked it up in preparation for this sermon. It's called Eating Twinkies with God. And in it, uh, a little boy, it starts with a little boy who's packing a bunch of snacks, Twinkies mainly, but also bottles of juice and other things into his backpack, putting it on his back and getting ready to walk out the front door. And the little mother's, uh, boy's mother is obviously curious, where is he off to with his backpack full of uh, treats? And frankly, far too accepting of a five-year-old boy leaving the house and going on a subway on his own, but that's another topic for another day. But she asks him, where are you going? And he replies, to find God. Oh, well, have fun. So he leaves, and he gets on the subway, he ends up at a park, and he sees a homeless woman sitting on a bench and sits down next to her and pulls out his Twinkies, starts eating one, and she looks over, kind of confused as to why this little boy is sitting next to her on a park bench when there's, like, plenty of space down the way. What's he doing? And he looks over and hands, uh, like, offers her up a Twinkie, and she accepts, and 
Uh, they eat them and start talking a little bit. He pulls out his juice bottles, gives her one of them. They start smiling and talking and talk for a while. And uh, then when they finish, the little boy gets up, waves goodbye, and heads off home. And when he gets home, he, his mom is obviously waiting at the front door and asks him, Well, did you find him? And the little boy, matter-of-factly, as only a five-year-old can say, says, God is a she, Mom, and she has the most beautiful smile. Then we cut back to the homeless woman who's smiling still and going on to a friend, and the friend says, uh, What are you so happy about? And the homeless woman replies, I just met God. Now, it's a story that I think succinctly explains what I think God intended when he gave Jesus Christ the title Emmanuel. Because God, if God can become human, then it really isn't about a specific human who lived at a specific time. Uh, the point of this uh, Emmanuel incarnation, which is a Latin word meaning enfleshment of God, is to remind us that every person is holy. We're all children of God, people of worth, cog pals, as I've said before. It's not just enough to say, well, treat everyone as if they might be God or Jesus in disguise, because the reality of Emmanuel is they are Jesus. We are Jesus. When we encounter each other and show one another love, we are encountering God. But we're also embodying God for them. This truth to me is so important because it changes the equation fundamentally. We're not talking about how Jesus came into the world in 0 AD, lived for 33 years, died on a cross, was resurrected, then went up to be with God and we're waiting for him to come back because the truth is Jesus never left. He not only said that he would leave us with the Holy Spirit, but in that Holy Spirit, I believe we become Jesus for each other. That incarnation, that uh, idea that God became human is not a historical event that we remember. It is a living, breathing reality. It is a living, breathing reality that is sitting on park benches even now. Or sitting in front of a screen, watching me preach this sermon right now. You see, God is with us all the time. In fact, God never left. Jesus is Emmanuel. And that's such a wonderful thing to know. It's also a uh, terrifying prospect because it means that whenever we see the face of another person we are seeing the face of God and it starts to make you wonder what have I been doing to God in the things that I've been doing to these people that God loves it brings us calls us to action it calls us to be the presence of God for another person because we are in the presence of God with that other person. So as we go forth today, I hope that you'll go forth seeing how that's a hope. It's a hope because when we say Jesus is Emmanuel, we are saying that Jesus, and through Jesus, God knows what we feel, has been through these things, has been tempted as we are tempted, and therefore uh, can comfort us more surely. But that also, Jesus is comforting us and the people around us. Help us to figure out how we can be that presence of God for somebody else. And in that way, we really, truly believe in that phrase, Emmanuel, God is with us. Amen.
Sovereign Lord, hear the prayers of your people today. We lift up those concerns on our hearts. We need your help in life's difficult times. Surround us, hold us. Gather us, your children, in your arms. Nurture us, cry with us. Today, we also lift up the joys in our lives. In our joys, you surround us and hold us. Gather us, your children, in your arms. Smile with us and laugh with us. God, hear our prayers for our world today. We pray for the global pandemic and the lives and livelihoods lost. We lift up all those medical personnel who work so long and diligently. We pray for businesses now closed, some of which will never reopen. We pray for all those facing eviction and homelessness. We pray for families spending the holidays apart from family and friends. God, in this time of struggle and loss, help us to see the joy of this Advent season, the joy that surrounds us each day. Joy in a beautiful sunset, in colorful decorations, in cards and calls from friends and loved ones. Joy in the faces of smiling babies and excited children. Joy in a decorated tree, in a favorite nativity set, in beloved scriptures. And God, never let us forget the profound joy that comes from a relationship with you. God, we lift up our prayers to you in the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We anticipate the day of his birth with joy. We pray all this and we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy Today, as we go out into our world, as we get ready to, to hear about these ministries that are going on at Bethlehem Market that's taking place right after this service ends, and I hope that you'll be a part of that from 10 to 11.30 today as we hear how God has been involved in these wonderful ministries across the world and what they need from us to help them continue. Um, I hope that you'll remember and go forth with the word Emmanuel. That you'll remember God truly is 
with us. God is with us and the people around us. And God has experienced what we experience, and so we can be comforted. We know that nothing can stop what God is doing in our world. And so we should not stray from the path, but continue to share that love, share that connection, share that that meaning and worth that all people have and realize that we are all holy. We are all the face of Jesus. We are all God incarnate. So let us go forth in that knowledge and maybe have it change our uh, actions in this next week. Amen.